to another episode of the Boobasticast with the one and only Alexander Hawk and the slightly less good-looking Matthew Fisher. <laughs> True. What can I say? No one can look as good as me. I can't. Uh, I'm trying to grow my beard out so I can be more like a handsome man like you. You are a very handsome man. You kind of you got a little bit of a chubby Nicolas Cage thing going for you, which is fantastic. And it's very lovable. The bees, not the bees. Not the bees, not the bombastic cast bees. Alexander. Yeah. Who we have on this motherfucker this week? Today we have Patrick Kilpatrick. Hey. Now, for those who might or might not know, this guy has been in so many, so many great films throughout the years. You got him. In the Toxic Avenger, the very first film he was in, you got him in the the Stan miniseries. You got him in Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis. You got him in the Replacement Killers, Minority Ooh. Report. He and 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 the thing is, uh, he's like a few other people we brought on, where he's most notably brought in playing, you know, bad guys, the heavy, and. I always think that they are the most unsung character actors in the industry because yeah. you have like a group of actors that, you know, fall in that category and, you know, they show up, they play the henchman, they play the, the main villain or, or the side villain. And a lot of times people are just like, oh yeah, I know who he is, but they don't really know who he is. They don't know anything about him other than, Oh, this is the guy I saw in this movie and <clears throat> that movie, yeah. and this is this is why we're bringing him on. We want to know more about him. We want, I mean, looking up on IMDb, he has uh, interesting uh, stuff of uh, doing journalism. Yeah. Uh, he was a bodyguard. I mean, he's done a lot of stuff, and we are here to find out more to delve into what. It is working in the industry where he's now and what the future holds. Yeah, for shizzle. Insignificance with Nicholas Rogue, you know, avant-garde filmmaker showing there from like Walkabout, Don't Look Now, uh, Last Man Standing, Eraser, uh, Class of 1999, which is a great cult classic right up there with Toxic Avenger. Um, did we say Eraser? I thought we did, but we might. We could I mean, have. We could have. We could have. And uh, best of the best two, my favorite of the uh, of the best of the best franchise, uh, with the great Eric Roberts, friend of the show. Me and Alexander worked on a film called House Across the Street with Eric Roberts. Um, we won't get into that story on this episode. You know what I mean? Uh, you guys are about to kind of jive into the mind of Patrick Kilpatrick. Um, hear a little bit about the Toxic Avenger, about his process, uh, the early years, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of good shite, you know what I mean? So uh, if you enjoyed this episode about to hit you, go grab his books. Hawkman, what are the names of the books for him? Uh, the books are... 30 Years uh, of Dying for a Living. Well, Dying for a Living, okay, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot, Volume 1. Yeah. Now, he has another book that he doesn't have out yet, but the title is uh, Volume 2, uh, Dying for a Living, Wasted Talent in the Valley of Debacle. Um, I, don't title, know, I, I don't know when that's going to come up, but I know that uh, it's in the process. It's on the, uh, the works to uh, come out. And like I said, uh, definitely it'd be interesting picking up both of these books and and reading more uh, of the stories and uh, because this is a guy that definitely has an insight into you know what it means to be a working actor yeah and uh our our guest is with us so ladies and gentlemen without any further ado the great legendary iconic man the myth the legend patrick kill patrick Welcome to the show. Morning, Patrick. How you doing over there? I'm really good. Uh, just finishing up the script on this movie we're getting ready to film. Cool. It's the kind of, uh, Yeah. 
reducing to acting. Uh, the active shooter project? No, no. Uh, this is something else. Um, I don't know. You, you know, the second person, I actually, I shut down all the podcasts except for yours and one other uh, during this time. Um, but you're the second person to ask me about that active shooter thing. I don't know what that's going to be. I have all the footage in my editing thing, and we've never just had any. The problem is, at that time, we were running around with a lot of different cameras, uh, shooting on the wing. I'm very script-centric, and we didn't uh, didn't work with the script. We just improv the stuff. I keep thinking we're going to cut it into social media posts or something like that, but the footage is so wild. Um, yeah. It's, uh, you know, we did a lot of helicopter wild boar eradication and uh, a lot of gun stuff. And uh, some of it is pretty cool, but I, I just don't know what it's going to become yet. So, yeah. and the level that we're operating on now after many years of script writing and, um, and, uh, graphics, you know, the introduction of my son-in-law into the graphics stuff that we're doing and everything else. It's just, it doesn't really measure up to the stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I don't, you know, unless it's really great, I don't want it to come out of the office. I hear that, yeah. We make films over here too, so we understand yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, we do indie films from Boston, Massachusetts. You know what I mean? Awesome, I love Boston. We love you back. Hell you yeah. Should have, you should have me out and we'll do something together. We would love that. We would love to make that happen for sure. We're, we're definitely I, down for that. I, say again? I said we're definitely down for that. I mean, we'd love to work with you. I mean, our whole thing, uh, like with this podcast, is uh, we're all about promoting people and, and bringing out people that, you know, people might know by just seeing you, but not know much more about you other than the roles you play. And, right. and we're all about, you know, just trying to expound and uh, get a dialogue. Yeah. I, um, well, you know, I was accepted to Tufts University, but my parents wouldn't let me go because they thought at the time, Boston and I were not a good combination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know, listen, I have had a grand time running around working with all kinds of people and it's been, uh, I'd never done a job. I didn't get some uh, reward out of it. You know, I, I try to elevate everything that I work on and, um, uh, um, I wasn't even looking, I mean, I'm blessed in COVID, um, I lost a couple of jobs because of COVID like everybody, but that was no big shakes. And I'd been writing scripts for a long time. So uh, I started getting hired as a script writer and a producer. And so uh, I put a team together of really great people and we, uh, we do a bang up job. And that's why the money is coming in for the stuff. And we keep getting, it's very rewarding. It's very challenging um, and long hours, uh, but we really, really uh, we're succeeding. And I think we're succeeding because we're delivering the goods, you know, um, and, you know, uh, and I honestly think the universe responds when you do that. And uh, I, um, I wasn't even looking for the money for this film and it just, fell into my lap and of course we had the materials to back up the conversation yeah. you know so um anyway um uh it's all good my wife i've got a couple of great guys uh raffaello casamatis and jeff snyder and uh on this one we're i'm bringing in friends and and uh guys that I've done who, you know, you, you wander around, you know, you wander around the independent film world. There are not that many people that you run into who are really stellar. And when they are, you really want to hold on to them. 
the, the people who are able to take a small amount of money and produce something that's really, really compelling. So when you go to the premiere, you know, you, you sometimes say, God, am I going to be embarrassed by what I see? Am I going to be whatever? And these, uh, so I, I, I've got some wonderful people. And also I've worked on a lot of jobs. There's no excuse to not deliver a really good film. Um, so many times directors say, oh, if I just had more money or if I just done that, or <clears throat> I don't want those conversations. I don't want that. So um, there are no excuses, brothers. <laughs> I agree with that completely. None. <laughs> yeah. We've been uh, we've been given compliments before because we I, we we believe in exactly what you say. Like we're from like a small small town, so to speak. You know, over in Boston doing movies. We're not quite in New York or Hollywood, but like we take pride in being able to take whatever money we can acquire and making like turning out a good quality project. You know what I mean? I love what Alex. Are you what have you been working on? Do you have links? Can you send it to me? I'll have uh, I'll have Alex send you some links after the show. Yeah. You know, okay. with COVID, everything's kind of been shut down heavily. You know what I mean? Um, even with the, everybody coming back, it's really shaky ground. You know what I mean? Because it's still kind of in the air. So people don't want to kind of trek out. And our, on our level, like when we, we would like our crews would mainly we, we would hire, you know, the appropriate main focal points. And then we would kind of let, you know, family and friends and people that we've kind of maneuvered with throughout because we've been doing it for like 15, almost 20 years. So like we know a bunch of people that want to help. So we kind of get a supporting team for those big units, you know what I mean? Like the DP and the ADs and all that. We get, you know, make sure they get the right people around them. Sure. Do yeah, what they yeah. got to do. You know, you got to put the, there's certain places you got, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't, can't skimp cut corners on a little bit, you know what I mean? Like cinematographers and editors and stuff like that. Um, but, you, you know, all your PAs and stuff like that and assistants can kind of, for the most part, be people that uh, are interested in the craft and doing it, but they don't, you know, it's not their nine to five type deal. Yeah, no, um, people, you have to have X amount of dollars to do quality work. Yeah. Um, um, you can do little things just on your own and there have been plenty of people but the artistry has to come from somewhere and i um by the way uh this is going to sound <clears throat> i know how to shoot a film safely in the uh, covid and i knew how to do it the day that covid happened yeah maybe you should hire me to assist in your next project i'm down i'm not um angling for a job because we got a lot of work but i mean i could uh the money didn't come for that one the, that idea yeah it came, came for something else but I, I in fact i don't know why people haven't deployed the idea that i have to do it because uh i guarantee you we can do it right in the middle of the in the first day of COVID, we could have done it and yeah. uh i uh i knew how to do it interestingly enough the location that i was planning on doing that project like the day that it started COVID, uh we have that location now and we're shooting another thing and um i want to listen as much as i'm talking but the bottom line is when COVID started, I put on a free acting class just to help out, just to give people something to do. And uh, it turned into this huge money maker. Uh, overnight, I started getting these producer clients and things like that. And one of the first producer clients was I told him, they come to me and say, how do I make film and TV work for this place where I am? And I said, well, this is how you do it. And I kind of rattled off a storyline for him. And it was a good storyline. And it captured uh, what he needed to do. And I said, now go get the money. And I gave him a price to go get the money and we'll do the film right in your location. And uh, he never got the money, but I did. So I came back and I said, uh, I, I, I'm always fascinated by the location. And so, uh, I, listen, I can't be, I'm so grateful and so blessed, uh, about 
what's going on because the universe is sending all the elements and, and uh, what are you guys working on? Right. Well, we got a feature length horror film that we want to start kicking up, you know, pretty uh -huh. soon. And then we get a psychological thriller that uh, we got to, we get, we're doing starring Alex over here that we, we talked to some producers over in California, like on our level type deal that want to help out, make it, they said they could double, the money that we have now, they can double, which will be nice. You know what I mean? Um, and well, you, uh, yeah. yeah, you're saying something very insightful. You have to have a plan for getting the money back for people yeah. because the people who give it to you are sacred. And yeah. so many filmmakers, they come out of school or whatever they're doing, they're not even thinking about that. Right. That's that's really where the rubber meets the road, where you got to, you know, you're involved in it. You got to put a lot of, um, a lot of uh, cards together to make that house so that it's an economic business. And sometimes that takes time and people don't really do it. Uh, distribution is, uh, is uh, on the waterfront. And if you don't do it properly, then uh, nobody is gonna make any money. And uh, so that's key. But that's a thing, something you should be thinking about right from the get go. And a lot of people don't, and it's immensely selfish because the, then the person who put up the money gets burned right. and they're ruined for everybody. So uh, um, it's a good business if you go at it skillfully, in my humble opinion. Um, and I'm very proud of we've made money for everybody that we've worked with. So. Um, uh, if you have vision and you have craft, I've seen $200,000 films that were fantastic. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you tell your budget that it's $200,000, then it's going to be judged in that regard. And I think the money part of it, you want to be able to say, you want to be realized the full benefit of the rewards that you have. So we don't really, I don't, I don't discuss budgets with anybody about what we're doing. Um, in fact, it's a delicate art form as to when you release anything about what you're doing. Right. Um, that's a, a publicity master game. Um, uh, I exist, I call Hollywood the culture of theft. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I mean that with all good spirit and I've never had anything really stolen from me because yeah. I think the universe um, protects people yeah. uh, who have integrity, but the universe also takes care of people that really know how to do things for themselves well. And, um, uh, unfortunately, we live in a world where the institution that you would think would draw you in for collaboration are actually dedicated quite to the opposite, to the theft of whatever you have and sucking everything from you. Yeah. And um, so, like you say, you have to align yourself with people of like integrity that you trust your brain trust and everything else. But look, look, it, it doesn't matter if it's China or if it's sending it over to Beverly Hills. You're talking about your intellectual property and your sweat and, and, and whatever. I mean, you know this. Am I telling you anything you don't know? No. No, no. But I appreciate hearing it from a professional. <laughs> you well, know what I mean? I mean, yeah. I tell we, when I've taught actors and stuff, I, I always say, get a good lawyer. Yeah. You know, you know, have a relationship. And if you don't, learn how to do that yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> You're awful quiet down there. What are, what's <laughs> going on with you? <laughs> um, I'm just listening. I, I have a very simple philosophy. Don't butt in unless you have something to add to the conversation. Word. So... I mean, I'm just listening, and, and this is all, you know, good, important stuff. I mean, like Matt's been saying, that uh, 
we've been uh, working on and on our own little level, we've experienced what you talk about, that there's there's people who, you know, rather, you know, uh, take or steal your ideas and mark them off as their own. And, uh, and we've been, you know, we've been lucky that nothing really bad has happened too much. And uh, we just keep on plugging around. We just cut those that are, uh, as, as we like to say, cancer to what we're trying to do. We cut them out and then we uh, keep going ahead. Right. Nothing uh, exactly. stops us, nothing deters us. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think there has to be honor among thieves or uh, honor among people. And um, I try to operate from generosity and a landscape of making people money. And certainly when I run into people that are like souls, then you want to treat them very, very well. And Obviously, you have to do it in the context of whatever you're doing. And um, uh, I'm really enthralled. It's a good time. I, I'm really having a fun time. And uh, it gets brutal. Um, but then you have the skill or the where, wherewithal <clears throat> to resurrect yourself. And that's, I'm very lucky that I was given those tools when I was younger. Uh, mostly by cataclysm, uh, had a terrible car accident. And so <clears throat> was able to learn very early what it took to resurrect yourself um, physically and mentally and emotionally. Um, uh, because the rigors of this stuff, if you're going to do it excellently, is uh, considerable. Um, Boston, love to work in Boston. <laughs> bring in get your uh get your winter coat out you know that would be such a blessing because i have some fabulous winter coats and i i just came from filming in amsterdam and it was so cool to be able to wear that stuff yeah um i've got some coats and that we can, can be used for wardrobe and uh and uh I, you know la i love la but the I love going into inclement weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up right across the border in Connecticut. Okay. Right across, right across the border from Springfield. And we used to skip school and go to the Big Easy, uh, the, uh, the big fair that the tornado went through a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I love that. I, Massachusetts is one of the prettiest states in the Fantastic. entire 50 Union. Yeah. Um, you know, I, honestly, it's one of the most beautiful states, possibly right up there. You know, it's right up there with Vermont being the most beautiful. I think they got some crazy gun laws, but, uh, you know, the really restrictive gun laws. You don't want to carry an unregistered firearm in Massachusetts. At least that's the way it was the last time I checked. I'm, you know, uh, what was it? Five years mandatory it's sentence? Five, yeah. Immediate five years. Yeah, it's still that. Yeah. yeah. Well, in a way, that's kind of good. You know the rules, so you better be I, 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 in that ring. I, by the way, I haven't done any shooting for years. I've been so enthralled with uh, movie making and, and, uh, and script writing and all the nuances of that and graphic arts and stuff. But I'm sure getting geared up again is for, for this one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We were training with the Netherlands Navy SEALs over in Amsterdam. Yeah. Damn. And uh, I learned a lot. And I've been shooting for 25 years, 30 years. And I mean, even before that, I was a kid. You guys tramp around the woods and stuff in Massachusetts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the best part of Massachusetts. I was in the woods earlier today walking the dog. Nice. Yeah. That's it. Dogs are the best thing. You ever go quail hunting? No. The dogs are the best thing about a pheasant hunting? I've no, no, I don't. I have an FID card. I have a pistol permit. Um, never been hunting, though. I've went, I've been to the range, but I've never been out there shooting anything. So yes. explain, explain that to me. You have a pistol permit. What's involved in that in Massachusetts? Uh, I just had to take a course. 
and then pay the fee and they gave it to me and I renew it, I think every three years or every five years, I think. Whenever they send me an, an envelope, I renew it. And you can carry or you can have it? I can carry it on my waist if I wanted to. I don't, but I could carry it on my waist. I keep it in a safe, of course, but yeah, if we wanted to carry it on our waist, I could just carry it on my waist anywhere. I mean, so, you can't go into certain places, but. And I, then I'm speaking out of my hat and Massachusetts is fairly loose. Yeah, they're cool about it. I mean, like, if you don't have the permit, that's troublesome. Then, then it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, but then again, like, you probably sure if you don't have a permit, you probably shouldn't be rolling around with a gun anyways, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. So I, uh, yeah. See, I, there, yeah, I jumped to the assumption that when I saw the five years that uh, they were really trying to keep people from having weapons at all. Uh, but that's clearly not the case. It, uh, it goes back and forth. I think who I think whoever's in the office is kind of how it go, it, it leans type deal. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I think they make a lot of money from that. I talked to Wayne Lapierre once, and I said, I said, you give me two hundred. And by the way, I said you send two hundred thousand dollars. Don't send it to me. I'll tell you, you know, I'll give you some suggestions where you send it, the right publicist, the right whatever, and we can put an end to the anti-gun movement for at least 10 years. Yeah. And because I, I knew, you know, you put the guns in Academy Award bags and permits, and even if you can't put the guns in, which you can't, you, you give them photo safaris to Africa and try to change the mindset. And he said... I don't think they really want to end the gun, uh, uh, the anti-gun movement, because they make so much money from it. Yeah. So it's a, it's an ongoing deal, which kind of brings up COVID. I, I wonder if this stuff is ever going to go away because they're making so much money with it. Yeah, I don't think it will. Yeah. I don't think it'll ever go away. I think it's one of those things that it, it's a new era upon us. You know what I mean? This is just the new going to be the new way. Every couple, every year or so, there'll be something new that you get vaxxed up for and get you boosters for. And it, it's weird. It's a weird time. But yeah, I think it's, I don't think we'll ever, like the same way China, you, like 10 years ago, that you, you look over there and everybody's wearing the mask. But like pre COVID, I think right. America will eventually become that where you go to the grocery store, half the people are going to be wearing the mask no matter what. You know, and I think that's just the new norm unfortunately yeah. but you know i think that's where we're going with it well, when, yeah, I was, like, yeah. when i was in amsterdam i went to the airport first of all you're like you're getting covid tested all the time and you're paying 70 euros here and 54 pounds here and you're doing all this other stuff and you go to the airport and they it's it looks like a set for a world war one movie they've got tents yeah. you know all over the place with nurses in kind of period um nurse uniforms and stuff and so you get a test at that airport and you pay for it there and stuff and i started thinking i mean you know it'll be really interesting to see if they ever get rid of this infrastructure because they're making a lot a lot of money from it and um but be that it said it's a wonderful world uh how else can <laughs> how else can i serve you yeah <laughs> Um, it's not insurmountable, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, you just, it's life. I, yeah. I agree with you. That's the way it's happening. I think actually it might, people are starting to become aware that, um, you know, Barbara Tuckman, she was a great writer and she wrote a book called A Distant Mirror which was about the 14th century. And anybody who thinks that we live in a violent era or a crazy era or a violent era or whatever, uh, or a disease-ridden era, should take a look at the 14th century because you had like two thirds of the people on the planet died from Ireland to India because of the plague. And then you had, and that caused the people humanity to lose faith in all their institutions before that it had been a, a medieval society and you know you had lords and vassals and everything else and uh, peasants and and serfs 
and they were all under the medieval order of the church and the, the uh, noble classes. Well, the plague swept through, killed everybody, and the, the priests wouldn't serve the people who were ill, wouldn't go in and serve them because they were afraid of being infected. Yeah. And the governmental officials wouldn't function because they were afraid of getting infected. And as a consequence, mankind, Barbara Tuckman's theory was, and I think it's a cool one, was that that was the birth of rational man. That was when man actually began to look around himself and say, man and woman, and began to look around themselves and say, uh, I'm somewhat uh, divorced from the institutions of the society in which I live, and they are not serving me. And so it was a mental shift to actually begin to think in terms of freedom mm. and, and, and you're defining your own existence. Well, about 10 years ago, I began to think of the world that we lived in somewhat in the same way, mostly because of the way the media was conducting themselves, that um, it, it, a, a situation had arisen that you couldn't trust any information that came from anyone from any direction. Yeah. So you had to open the blinders up and, and figure out ways how to, to uh, view the world, to conduct yourself in the world within that sphere of misinformation and disinformation. So um, I think of this as a time somewhat like the 14th century in that, that mankind hopefully will step out and begin to think in terms of their own realities. Um, on a Sunday morning, that may not be what you thought we were going to talk about, but <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, I, I think uh, people, uh, now totalitarianism and authoritarianism are pretty hard to shake. And, um, you know, one of the projects we got hired for was involved China and involved America and Taiwan and a lot of stuff. And that's about as much as I would tell you about it. But doing the research on that, mind blowing, mm -hmm. just mind blowing what actually is transpiring and the jockeying. And the truth is, everybody has a point of view. And um, you kind of have to listen to the points of view and decide which way you want to go. Yeah. Um, uh, I would urge people to really study China and to study um, their the relationship with Taiwan and uh, to to we are in a, a global jockeying position with all kinds of players on the stage and uh, it's not always black or white and it's not always what uh, uh, there are no heroes in the game to yeah. some extent. Um, now that's not true. There are heroes on both sides and very brave and noble people on both sides. Um, I hope we're able to work it out instead of jockeying and getting into conflict uh, with each other. But that's probably going to happen on some level just because it's like a family where siblings fight. The reality you're talking about is tens of millions of people and in being involved in the fights. Now, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but there's going to be a lot of abrasion, uh, I think, because people have to add, act like we're all together in this thing and uh, protect themselves, of course, but act like we're all together instead of acting like our own little selfish spheres is the way that we operate. Um, yeah. What I try to cultivate in a film experience that I am initiating is somewhat of like a, 
family of Navy, Navy SEALs or warriors or stuff. That's a militaristic analogy. But people who have watching each other's backs on different things and are operating from the sphere of integrity and truth um, uh, in their actions that they're doing about it. I think it's the, a powerful way to get things done. Um, if you have people who are only selfish and out for themselves, then it can be an interesting phenomenon, but you're yeah. probably not going to be able to do a collaboration uh, for right. very long, you know, because, and that's the interesting thing about directing and producing or being a leader of any kind or whatever. When I go on a film, I'm, I'm a swabby. I'm an executive officer. I'm a, at best, I'm a captain. It's their ship. Um, uh, one just hopes to be on crews that are devoted to the elevation of the art form and to putting out the greatest product that is possible, yeah. which is not always the case, you know? Right. Um, uh, I'm a conscious that I need to probably take my wife out and get her some air as she proofs my script before we go, but, um, Oh, how else can I serve you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, one thing that I, I always like to say about a podcast is, I mean, of course, we're, uh, we're filmmakers. Uh, I'm mainly acting. He's mainly a uh, producer, director. Um, and of course, we want to hear the stories, the experiences that you and other people have experienced in like the beginning of your career and how how things, you know, kind of evolved from that. Um, well, it's a lengthy thing. I have so many stories and I think so many instructive things that I wrote 600 pages worth of book. Um, uh, that was too much to launch in one book, I felt. So I, I there's a uh, Dying for Living uh, volume, volume one is on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and audio and uh, Audible and Kindle and all of that. Um, and then the second volume is coming out. Uh, it's been backburnered a, a bit, more than a bit. I was happily polishing it when COVID started. And the script writing uh, and the producing came along and that was so important. And I could see that the tapestry that we could play on with that. So I put that on, but it's written and I just have to polish it. And uh, volume two is all show business. Um, uh, I, I've run a mentorship program for a long time. Uh, we put that on hold for production and, and uh, stuff as well. Um, uh, I, uh, there's a lot and we all have something to share. And I guarantee you, you've got something to share from me. Um, you're acting, where are you in that? What would you like to know about acting? Well, I mean, one of the things that uh, I, because you, you, your career has, you definitely have played a lot of heavies, a lot of villains throughout the years. And, and one of the uh, things that, I always kind of struggle with myself is that when when you have a tendency to be in a niche, not playing like for example playing villainous characters, but not playing the same villainous characters, giving death to yeah. each one. So each one yeah. is different. I mean, it's still coming from you, but giving each one a different kind of flair, a different uh, uh, thing to it. I mean, how, how do you tackle that? Well, um, I do a great deal of work improvisationally on, on the set and in the moment, but that's not without a lot of preparation. Uh, like I'll, uh, I'll read the script and I'll write you know, a lot of improvisation um, that have to do and sort of, and memorize them, but memorize them enough that you can play with it and stuff like that. And so um, 
I mean, I joke around and say I deserve a screenwriting credit for every film I'm on because I'm most, a lot of this, I mean, this goes back for a long way. You take Death Warrant, okay? Remember Death Warrant? Yeah. yeah. I, had, I had 10 lines. I wrote all of them. <laughs> you know, um, the, the bottom line is being able to write and imp improv is the one of the greatest gifts that an actor can have because you're going to be in a lot of projects that, God bless them, the scripts are, are not fully realized or fleshed out, and you all want to bring something to it. And so I feel really blessed that the universe forced me or began me as a writer. And because of the car accident I had, I became a professional writer for uh, many years at magazines in New York. And so I have the head of a writer and, and the uh, body and instrument of an actor uh, when I restored myself after the thing. So to answer your question succinctly, you have to always guard against, am I using the same tricks that I used to success in a previous job? Uh, so um, am I repeating myself, you know, because, you know, look, like people say, hey, Patrick, you got a great grin, okay? But am I using that grin just as a trick uh, and it's a, and it's a, a constant trick? Um, does that make any sense? You, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, I make a good living and I put my kids through colleges, great colleges, and uh, I've lived a, a good life and stuff. But in the really, in the end, the reason you're as a, you're an actor is not because you are enthralled by that, although that's a vital component to it too, because it allows you to maintain yourself and take care of the people you love and to visit excellence on your life and stuff like that. But you really, for me, if you're not really into the absolute joy of creating that moment and expanding it and making it more challenging and making it more perhaps more elegant and more low-key uh, playing with that experience of actually um creating those moments that's the essence of what we do as actors yeah. and so um if you are doing that creative process then you're not normally going to be doing the same tricks that you used to advantages before. And also your life progresses. You know, um, you play heavies. I play, have played heavies. Uh, knowing full well I could play good guys too, but the casting system uh, does the most expedient thing. And... Uh, and, but in that circumstances, I, I, I'm always looking at what is going on in the world outside of me in villainy, who's doing fabulous jobs in that and what did they do and where would you, they do that. But more importantly, I'm allowing me as I'm experiencing me at that particular moment, you know, um, I, I talk about it. My, I'm not going to see. That's a story. There's a story I tell about Daniel Day Lewis that references this stuff. Um, mm. Because if you're a working actor, you can turn on a dime, and you can do. They can hand you a, an accent, and they can do. They can hand you new scenes. If I'm working with Spielberg, he 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 comes in in the morning with a new scene. And you're boom, like boom, like that. And so uh, I, I do a lot of getting to the, to the set if the script isn't fully realized. And I always ask permission to do this too, because some people uh, want the lines exactly as they are. So you want to give them that, but how about if I do this and what should you, you know, what would you think about that? And normally now they all are, want me to do that. Yeah. Because that provides um, a naturalism to it and it brings a, 
a, a vocabulary they might not have thought about and stuff. We all have this separate way of, uh, of coming at life. And so you really have to listen to the other people and see how their thing fits in. When I'm going into directing a person, an actor or something, or even any kind of creative people, I don't lay my trip on them right away because I want to see what they bring to the table because they may, they will almost certainly bring something that is, um, that is enriched and different than I might have thought about. Um, yeah. And so if you're constantly saying, what can I do? No, you can't become a guy that sometimes you just have to say the lines. Yeah. You know, just, just say the lines and live in the moment. But a lot of times you'd have to say, you always have to say, am I falling back on old tricks that serve Patrick so well and under <laughs> siege too and all this, you know, it's like, I, it's not, it's a whole other world. I don't even operate with the past work so much, you know, um, at all. Does uh does music play a part in your process of character building? I know you you, you know in the you, you wrote for a lot of music publications. Uh, I know that you yeah. did some bodyguard work for some pretty big bands back in the day. Yeah. Um, you know, do you when you come into a character, does each character have his own little playlist, his own little soundtrack? When, like, like Alex said, uh, there's a lot of villainous roles, but they're different. I mean, what would make you decide what playlist would be for this villain and what playlist would be for that villain, so to speak? Or is it more of maybe the like uh, like an, a certain band you'll listen to or a certain one song, two song you do over and over again? Or do you just have like a stretch? Do you listen on set at home? You're, it's a very, very insightful arena of conversation that you're bringing up because um, I would say the quick answer is every job is different mm. and that music has played a significant, there was a time where every job I did, I thought, I thought of a song, whether, even if it was just for an audition of a song that that character would say now it, it, sing, but you have to be careful with that because you don't want to force the production to have to buy that song. Right. But um, it's uh, music in that context was really useful because, you know, if I'm talking to you and I go, what does that do? That kind of relaxes you and yeah. puts you in a different headspace yeah. and stuff like that. So you're coming in to do a movie where you're killing somebody or killing five guys and you're bop, bop, aloo, bop, 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 aloo, bop. Yeah. nobody's done that they had done that at the time i mean you know i learned so I, I i would find songs that were in the public domain by that i mean uh songs that nobody owns the copyrights to and stuff like that or you could just do a lyrical thing uh you know like you probably wouldn't get sued for going bop, bop, aloo, bop, 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 aloo, yeah. bop whatever you do you know hey whatever you do and that's useful because it would set up the auditions so these people would be like what the fuck is this excuse my language what is this guy doing you know so and then that it also relaxes you at the same time so yeah when i'm writing i've used really specific music to listen to continually through it but that's not appropriate for the next script yeah. You know, you, something else is doing this. We're building the music for for uh, this one, and I'm working with a guy from Amsterdam uh, and building a, just a signature to feel that that kind of thing. And I'm acutely aware of soundtracks uh, in, and have always loved them and, and interested in what people are doing and always with great interest and sometimes complete appallingness. How the hell could yeah, you yeah, do yeah. that? You know, um, so music does play a big part. Um, sometimes when I'm writing, I cannot endure the sound other than um, the silence in order to focus on what I'm doing. There are other times where I uh, play certain people just because 
to lift you out of just the, the, the place where you are. So um, that may be disturbing to other people who are in the writings, writer's room with you. Um, mm. But of course it does. And listen, before I came on the podcast, I turned, uh, I was feeling really battered, really battered. Because anybody who writes a script uh, with everything they've got or acts with everything they've got or runs for office with everything they've got or works in an emergency room or whatever, then they're drained. But so I, I put on a, a film that's current and I thought while I was exercising and I, I said, this isn't me. So I put on the Morrison documentary, the Doors more, uh, documentary. And that, that's a, that's a, a, a uh, a spiritual who was ever cooler right. than the doors and Jim Morrison who was ever cooler than that moment in time that lifted those guys out of I mean Light My Fire was the first song Robbie Krieger ever wrote yeah Crazy. and you know it, it's like so and and I urge anybody who's you know the Val Kilmer is are one of our best and one of our greatest. But you, if you watch The Doors, you see the mastery of what he did. But watch Strange Days, which is the documentary of Jim, the actual Jim Morrison, and it's mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, the guy was absolutely a creature who fell out of space for one moment in time and united with some other people for one moment in time. And, and, and that was it. And so, Yes, <laughs> music <laughs> plays a part. <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I had to get over the fact that I had worked as a bodyguard with guys who were probably the most seminal creators uh, of music in history. Pink Floyd? You know, what? Pink Floyd? Well, my wife loathes Pink Floyd. Really? Wow. Yeah. She doesn't see the value in it at all, but I, I bodyguarded for them and I see the value in it. But I see her point too, because look, different times, different places. You know, my son was bored to tears by Bruce Springsteen at, at, at one point. And uh, I, Bruce Springsteen was so, we used to hire him for $500 to play piano in the student center at the University of Richmond. And he couldn't get arrested. And that was unbelievable. And my roommate recorded every single, oh. everything he did on these giant reel to reel things that he took into the concerts with um, uh, the backpacks. I called him, I said, what did you do? I forget what, something happened to those tapes, but um everybody's sensibility is different you know like my sons are 25 30 and they they when they were growing up they'd rush to show me this particular music that meant a lot to them and they you know they went through the mumford and sons things and uh and um you know whatever they were going through interestingly enough they're into sort of country now yeah. And their their sensibilities and artistic sensibilities is so far from that. Um, so, but they all love Led Zeppelin. Of course. They, which I totally get. And I, and I never directed them to that. Yeah. They found that stuff on their own. And so music yeah. is something that is, the one thing I would have liked to have done is do more of that. And that's why I'm playing with this, with this movie. Where I'll probably write the songs for it, and why? Why should I pay somebody else to do the lyrics? Although right. we'll bring in some other people for things and stuff too. Yeah. Um, I, if you ever wrote a script, a couple of times I've said, "Why the hell did you just become a songwriter?" Because this 125-page stuff, where every single thing is linked. You know, it's, I think songwriting now, the, from what I understand, the business of songwriting is much more challenging uh, and, and dirty and everything else uh, on some level. But who knows? I mean, to put four or five lines together and put a chorus on it, great art form. But I think screenwriting is far more challenging if you do a brilliant screenplay. Yeah, for sure. So... Uh, 
It's like one big song. You know what I mean? That's all it really is. It's got to work as a whole. Yeah. And it's amazing what gets made that doesn't work as a whole. You know, it's Matt, it's really interesting when you go on a studio film and they've got $70 million on it and they don't have a realized script as you're beginning to act and film. Yeah. So uh, the vision has to come some, some, from somewhere. And in that case, the director pulled it together and uh, did some revolutionary things. With the, with the bodyguard thing, how exactly did you get into bodyguarding bands? Because I know, you, you know, you, there was some real heavyweight bands you got to like uh, guard, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, I got out of the University of Richmond and I, um, I went to New York and, to be a writer and uh, I got a job writing for Prentice Hall Publishing Company. I was getting paid 6,500 bucks a year. And uh, uh, the, the boyfriend of my then girlfriend's, uh, the boyfriend of my girlfriend's best friend uh, was a, he was a real kind of New York entrepreneurial guy. He had like a, a, uh, a, a car wash, mobile car wash kind of thing. And yeah. he said, he said, do you want to do a bodyguarding security? It was a time when, uh, concert attendees, they didn't like police much, mm, you know, at, right. at the concerts. And so um, they said, uh, we're putting this crew together to do this. And there were nine of us. And essentially, whenever a rock band came into the New York area or uh, Long Island or New Jersey, Pink Floyd was in New Jersey to hark back to that. And uh, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I made a huge amount of money doing it relative to my life at the time. Yeah. They used to pay us with 50 tickets to every concert. There you go. Nice. And, and nice. you were allowed to sell them. And, that, and plus it was an extraordinarily corrupt venture uh, because, um, people would open the door and just give you a hundred bucks and you'd go in and stuff like that. And I was on the stage with a lot of them uh, while it was going on. And it was a fantastic lark for a young guy fresh out of college. And, yeah. and uh, I saw a lot of amazing stuff, a lot of amazing groups, a lot of violent activity in New York. Um, yeah. I feel greatly privileged to have done that. Um, uh, what was that like? It was a, a period laced with a lot of drugs, not personally, but the whole environment. Right. Um, you know, uh, I remember one night a, a nude girl came on the stage with um, uh, Jefferson. Uh, I think they were Jefferson Airplane at that time. And I, uh, cause, but I still, bo I bodyguard them when they became Starship. And um I picked her up and carried her off of the stage and it turned out she'd been hired by them as a dancer on the thing. But there's all those stories you're in the uh, volume one of the book about that stuff. I saw Hendrix so much, I actually started to get bored. It's not that I got bored. I just had been there, done there, seen that. And I would walk to the deep reaches of the, of the stadiums and see what was going on there. And uh, I was very blessed to, yeah. to do that. It's Rikers crazy. Island, Rikers Island, where they had the prison, they had some the wildest things, the things in the Bronx. I forget what the place in the Bronx was a place underneath the subway. Huh. It was basically a apocalyptic compound surrounded by barbed wire and, you know, that corrugated metal thing. And you'd have thousands of people watching the band. Not so, much, you know, maybe a couple of thousand and Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck up there playing and people being stabbed and the subway going over, over the thing. It was, um, it was pretty wild. Crazy I, I was very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, you should do a documentary about that time. That'd be funky. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a good idea, but you know what? I'm a hired gun and I Bro. go where the money is. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Speaking of I, uh, 
Uh, I'm so busy getting uh, jobs that I'm getting paid for that um, serving those people. But you're absolutely right. And, and you know what? You could do it with found stuff, yeah. uh, uh, materials and stuff like that. In fact, I went through a period where I was watching a lot of those documentaries, the one on uh, Iggy Pop, yes, uh, the, the Stooges, and... Uh, and you can see that they're just putting newspaper articles together and a few talking heads and stuff like that. So really good idea. Yeah, if that guy. happens, um, uh, would you like to be a co-producer with me on it? Yeah, I'm definitely down for that. Okay. Yeah. You know, be unlike the culture of theft, I actually work with people who bring <laughs> me a good idea. I just don't <laughs> go away from them. So that's a project that we could work on together. I would love to do that. Yeah. And let, I me would, find, uh, let me let me find the money for it, either from my own funds or from somebody else, and uh, then we'll, because I'm a I'm a huge believer in professionalism. Yeah. Everybody gets paid. Everybody's got to go home better off. They got to take care of their families and go from there. Yeah. I got the editing system right here. I got a studio level editing system. Uh, five feet from me word yeah working with little money as we do over here you know it, it causes you to be a little more creative i think with finding out different ways to kind of get your points across on you know reasonable hence newspaper articles and stuff like that uh since we brought up big money we can talk about uh, the first acting role the toxic avenger yeah, now, they loved what i did they doubled my salary from 75 to 150 dollars for the week yeah nice uh, we me and alex both have worked with trauma a uh, handful of times you know very the independent punk rock spirit of uh the underground filmmaking scene you know what i mean the toxic avenger the film i credit to being one of the influences that made me want to make movies strictly because it was like they could show you didn't need the hundred million dollars to make something entertaining you know what i mean yeah. um the leroy character in there i love that that scene alone is like one of the greatest things of all time. It's so, it's so like, it's, it's like, what's the best way to describe it? It's like, it's crazy. It's just crazy and madness. I love that whole, and a quick question for you. I could be wrong. Did you play two parts in that movie by any chance? Like, did you play the Leroy part and then come back for like uh, another, maybe smaller thing? I could no. be crazy. No? no, okay. It was only that character. I'm crazy. No. I am a crazy guy. <laughs> but uh, what was it like work? What was it like working with Lloyd and Tromer at that time? You know what I mean? I'm very curious. That's kind of their their heyday. Yeah. Like, doesn't they blew up? And the Toxic Avenger is a huge cult classic, beloved. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, do you have any memories from back and back working on that one? Well, of course I do, and that's in the book. In the too. book, but, um, but um, I uh, a couple of key things. I uh, yeah, I, I am. I remember the whole thing. Uh, I think it was. Um, you have to <laughs> have to read the book. I, we'll I, read I, the book. Long, a long, a long thing, but. Um, there are a couple of instructional things that I got from that. First of all, I, I showed up there and to me, I, I just come through doing a bunch of NYU student films, which I was, I was, when I fell into acting, I was working at a high level as an assistant director with a big time Broadway director. Uh, and, and, but also I founded my own theater company with three other people down in the East Village. And uh, so I was working at that level too. And um, uh, I, would, I was doing soaps and I was doing uh, off-Broadway shows and I was doing regional theater and I was writing plays and I, um, I did a lot of NYU student films. I went there for film and videotape for a graduate program that Prentice Hall, my first publishing job, they would pay for you to go to any higher education uh, thing while you were there. And so I looked at NYU and, they, and the film classes and video classes were the most expensive classes they yes. had. So I said, those are the ones I'm going to do. And so as a, as a result, I ended up doing a lot of NYU student films. 
And so Toxic Avenger, I forget how that happened because I, I, I may have had some agents. In those days, you could have more than one agent in New York. And they, you know, you didn't have to have a contract with anybody. You could have two or three. So I was getting auditions from people. So they sent me over and I viewed it as a, just a, another student film, you know, because it was, you know, down and dirty and it was a low budget film production and stuff. And I literally thought it was the worst movie I was, had ever been involved in in my life that when yeah. I was doing it. And because, you know, look, I was a, I was mostly an athlete and a reading writer kind of guy growing up. So I was gravitated towards big films like Ridge Over the River Kwai. And, yeah. uh, you know, even if you were doing the smaller stuff, the media stuff like Rocket Man. Did you guys ever watch Rocket Man? Watch Rocket Man on YouTube. Rocket Man, the TV show. Okay. Little 15 minute serials. Um, but John Wayne movies like Sands of Iwo Jima, uh, all the dinner for eight the stuff that was uh, dinner at eight, you know? So I was into whatever I was into. And here was this, it's a generational thing. The reason I think Toxic Avenger speaks to that generation is because it, it has that sort of tongue in cheek, um, view of the world and I to, to me nothing where I came from which was pretty prestigious theater and pretty prestigious um uh study at uh, working as a, an assistant director on Broadway and stuff nothing could be further afield from that than Toxic Avenger yeah so <clears throat> I thought this is a, like another student film that we were doing and so I got into it, and I, I and full disclosure, uh, Leroy is definitely based on Malcolm McDowell's um, uh, Alex, K Alex in, in Stanley uh, Kubrick, Kubrick's work. Yeah, and um, I had a lot of fun with it, and they liked what I did. So I said they gave me instead of seventy-five bucks, they gave me one hundred fifty. And I also remember um, that the movie seemed to be financed by this really, really older guy, very frail <laughs> and very old. And he uh, stick thin and he would arrive in a, like a rolls with two giant bodyguards, like muscle guys. And I, I, th I, I said mob immediately. That's what it said to me. <laughs> so... And his girlfriend was the lead blonde chick. Okay. Huh. And I think he probably funded the movie. If not, that could be an assumption on my part, but he would show up and I got the impression that that's where the money was going. That could be wrong. But for whatever it was, I was going out with this beautiful um, Israeli girl at the time. And... Uh, you know, everybody was sleeping with everybody at that time. Nobody was being faithful to anybody, particularly if if you stepped out on a woman. Uh, you know, that's unleashing her to do whatever she does. But anyway, we loved each other a lot, but we broke. Uh, we were breaking up, and she was going off with a billionaire uh, real estate guy who was much much older. And I was kind of hurt by that. And I also thought, here's the other thing though. She was a really talented fashion designer. And the moment the economic necessity for doing that and making that business go and, and making it hustling and doing that, which is an integral part of fashioning a business sensibility. She never fashion design. Once she came under the economic umbrella of this billionaire, she never did the fashion design. And I think there's something a little bit sad about that. Mm -hmm. And so now she had a great life as a socialite and uh, became a great social figure in New York and stuff like that. So uh, I, I don't know that she'd ever think about, but she was a really talented fashion designer. So I had the theory that when a young, beautiful woman opts out economically with an older guy like that, because clearly it's not physical. I mean, it's not a, 
fundamental. It's because the money is elevating whatever. I'm not saying there can't be something really elevating mentally uh, because that older person has really a lot of experience and a, a lot of charm and, and maybe uh, has a, 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 a vision of the world that's really knowledgeable to play with. But these are the decisions we make uh, on our own. But for me, it seemed like a loss that this woman never did fashion design because she was super talented. Yeah. So um, I was sitting with the lead actress at Toxic Avenger one day and I, and I said, you know, I don't think it's a good thing for young women to go out with older guys like that because it removes the drive. Like you, if you, you want to be an actress, if suddenly you have all of your economic needs taken care of, there's no reason to go drive. You got to, and particularly as you go along in acting, you're acting, okay, it's tough. Yeah. It gets to a point where it's challenging. And the ups and downs of it, a friend of mine once said, what is the making of an actor is what happens when there isn't any work. Because then you, do, then you decide who's a, really an actor. When they, you're making all the money and you're doing stuff, but what happens when there's no work, when there's a worldwide real estate recession? What happens when uh, you know, uh, there's a terrorist attack on 9-11 and there's no acting work? Do you abandon acting? Do you uh, go away from that? Um, those are the defining things of, of our lives. So anyway, I said to her this day, I think that's not a good idea. I just said, I don't think young, beautiful women should go out with older guys and have all their economic needs met. And I, what happened was, I'm sure she went home and she <laughs> said to this mob guy, uh, which I'm envisioning, he was a mob guy. Yeah. He says, Patrick says, I shouldn't go out with you because uh, my career impulses will be subverted. Well, the next night I'm on the set and I was no small. I was a bodyguard for rock groups. I was a football player. I was, uh, you know, 210 pounds of real good shape. But these two huge guys, I'm in the urinal <laughs> urinating and these two huge guys come in one on either side of uh, on me and they go they go you're not to talk to sylvia to mr uh, to sylvia ever again and I, I was like i you know i'm sitting there with my member in my hand <laughs> urinating and I, I look at these two guys and they're both bigger than i am and i said <laughs> i said sure whatever you say. <laughs> and so uh, I remember that was an incident that, uh, you know, they, they turned around and I, you know, I shook off and, and went back to work. But um, I remember that incident very much. Um, I also remember the special effects because they hired guys, they hired guys without arms <laughs> yes. so that they could rip their arms off which I thought was, God bless them. You know, I do the same thing if I have a wounded warrior and, and it fits or something like that. But I'm also doing it because I, I want those guys to have pinnacle experiences yeah. and earn a living and somehow say, I'm okay with the fact that I got 85% of my uh, face burned off and I wouldn't be here on a film with Patrick if I hadn't done that, you know, if that my life hadn't, because I think it's all meant to be. So there's a bunch of stories. The other funny thing about Toxic Adventure is it took them four years to get it out. Yeah. And by four years, I had progressed pretty well in, in the acting thing at that time. And I had done a lead in the largest production in the history of PBS, public broadcasting, you know, really lofty stuff and period stuff with Victor Garber and Paul Guilfoyle, all guys who've had substantive careers. Giancarlo Esposito was like my uh, a, a second sailor to my admiral and stuff like that. Yeah. So four years later, it was called Roanoke, largest production in the history of uh, uh, public broadcasting at the time. And I opened the New York Times and there's a glowing review of Roanoke. 
And on the left side was a glowing review of Toxic Avenger. And I said, there's a taste for everybody in this business. Yeah. And, and that's exactly, and not only New York Times, but Variety, the same thing. Roanoke on one side and, uh, and, and Toxic Avenger on the other. So on that note, I probably should leave you guys. And I, I, uh, that was showed me this business is full spectrum. Yeah. Well, so, Patrick, this was a lot of fun. Um, I, everybody should go check out the books. Um, can we ask you one more question? Sure. All right. We usually like to end, we usually like to end the show with um, asking because we have a lot of artists that watch the show and listen to the show. We usually like to ask, you know, do you have any advice for anybody out there that kind of might have caught themselves in a snag or kind of in a real dry spell? And uh, so maybe words of wisdom to kind of keep their morale up when things aren't looking so good. My first uh, instinct is to say you're not caught in a snag and you shouldn't ever be caught in a snag. Uh, 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 there's a solution to what you're doing. Number one, you're exactly in the place and moment in time where you're supposed to be because you're supposed to pick yourself up and go forward in a creative thing and you're going to pick up skills that you need. Uh, as a father, when acting disappeared for me, as it does for everybody sometimes, and, and stuff like that, when it, low times, you know, uh, worldwide real, real estate recessions, terrorist attack, 9-11, whatever it is, you're where you are, and there's a skill set that you should be learning during that time. And you are, the universe, I call these moments in time, God's pivots, mm. um, because it seems negative, but it's not. You're getting exactly what you need. You're getting heartbroken from a relationship because your uh, your your love partner has ditched you, or it's broken up. You're learning about that emotional life. You're getting your leg blown off in Afghanistan. You're getting the stuff that you need to be a stand-up comedian and the empathy that you need to. Uh, to go back to the Defense Department and become a warrior with your brothers. You're getting the, the moment in time where you can learn how to function with an artificial limb and become a, a rock star uh, in a bodybuilding, whatever it is. And, and I've seen that happen. So don't come from the mindset that you're in a moment of negativity. You're getting exactly, COVID was exactly what we all were supposed to get in God, the universe's plan, whatever you call its plan, so that we could all learn to function and be creative. So that would be the main thing to do. It, beyond that, I'd have to know what the specific snag is. Look, um, when I first started screenwriting, I, I, I struggled and I struggled and I, I still struggle um, sometimes, but there's a solution out there. Ask for help. Ask for help. Don't sit in the struggling for too long. I, my wife, you know, I asked her for, I've got a problem with a, a staff person or uh, something. And I say, it's driving me nuts, you know, and boom, the process of talking that out, God love her. She comes up with an idea or something occurs to me in the conversation and that solves the issue. Um, I don't do it all the time, but none of us have any time for negativity. We really don't. We've got to figure our way out of it. And uh, now, by the way, if you're feeling negative, good. You're learning how to feel negative. As an actor or a writer, you're going to have to visit that. Yeah. You know, uh, that's the glory of what we do, that we can say everything we're doing is research. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> so uh, the specifics, there's always a solution. And sometimes somebody outside of your circumstance has a solution. It's disappointing when you talk to somebody and you give them a solution and they keep coming up with different excuses of why they can't. There are no excuses. There just aren't. Um, I keep returning to this. I shouldn't just return to Navy SEALs, but return to Marine Recon or um, the Rangers or the nurses at hospitals or uh, that kind of thing. You have to get it done. And you also have to know how to take care of yourself too. 
If yeah. you're in a toxic situation, you got to get out. Um, so there's solutions. You're getting what you're supposed to get, mm -hmm. no matter how. Look, bad events, quote unquote, bad events. Yeah, it's an opportunity. A woman gets raped, horrible event. What's important? How they react to that, how they accept. Uh, the guy who founded America's Most Wanted, his six-year-old son yeah. murdered. What did he do? He took that energy and took it into, I don't know that you ever get over something like that, but he took that energy into God's plan to, to actually create America's Most Wanted and brought down a lot of bad guys to, to justice. You know, it's we all have challenges, and that's part of life, and that's part of the making of us, and it's supposed to happen. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if you've hit a snag, the other thing is they can send me an email if they're hitting a snag, and uh, we do that as a business. They can hire us to whatever, um, and I'll give them the solution. You know, yeah. um, I'm very lucky that when I started, I had the director on Broadway who could direct me to excellence and where the schools are, where to stay away from and what to do, that kind of thing. You know, uh, mostly people wander in the wilderness not knowing how to find their way to excellence. Um, there's a way. I mean, look, we all go through times. I just, we, uh, uh, you do the best you can until all of a sudden the heavens open up and they will open up mm. and, and, and here it comes. So yeah. onward and upward guys. I'll yeah. see you too. And I look forward to working in Boston. <laughs> Emotions are inspiring and, you know, going through some of those hard times helps create a well-rounded person as well as an artist. You know what of, I mean? Of course it does. If you react badly, you're going to destroy yourself. Yeah. Don't destroy yourself. Correct. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful world to live in. If you're tired and exhausted, get a massage, go for a walk, walk on the beach, jump in a cold pool, mm. a frigid pool, do something to shake yourself up. You know, let's suppose you're doing a take as an actor and you do a brilliant take. It doesn't matter whether you did a brilliant take or a lousy take you got to shake that one off and move forward. So <laughs> and go for it. Yeah, it's true. For you sure. Yeah. You got to leave the past behind and go forward. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Patrick, we thank you very you. much for your time, no man. Um, we'd love to have Good you on again and do those projects. Let's do those projects. You got that. And uh, I'm, I think it's a brilliant idea for us to do a documentary. Let's talk about that. When you got my email, do I have your phone number? Um, um, I will, I'll send you. I'll send you all that info. Yeah, or Alex yeah. will, and then we'll we'll link up. Yeah, I'll send you all through the email. Sounds great. Hell yeah! Have a great day, guys. Hi, you too, Here. Patrick. Thank you. Take care. Thank you Tell the wife we said hello. They said hello, Heidi. They said hello. <laughs> all right. Hey. Hiya. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers. You later. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. That was a great interview with Patrick <laughs> Kilpatrick. Very Thank good you. dude over there, you know what I mean? It was a pleasure to talk to him. Uh, the gentleman, uh, all throughout the childhood, you know, in films, you know, just killing it. You know, insignificance, we didn't get to, get, get to pop into. Or Class of 1999's a masterpiece, Death Warrant. We got a little bit of that. Best of the Best 2 movie that I love for my childhood. The Stand, the TV series directed by Mick Garris. Under Siege 2, Eraser, Last Man Standing, Minority Report. Booyah, dude, it goes on and on. Uh, he's got two books out there on the subjects. So we're going to poke into those books and you poke into those books out there and we'll have Patrick back on again. And uh, if anything isn't addressed in the book, you bet your ass we're going to address that in the next interview. And uh, stay on the lookout. Collaboration projects. You heard it here first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Killing it, dude. Uh, Hawk, what'd you think, bud? This is a oh, Hawk fine. I, I see, I mean, this, this, I mean, I gotta say, this is, this is beautiful. This is what I love. I, I, I know I've said this before, it's a broken record, but I, 
if you ask me what we'd be, you know, talking about on this show, I I would have been probably a hundred percent wrong, because we went into a direction that we didn't see, but we love that. We love the fact that you know we talked more about you know the screenwriting, the 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 nuts and bolts of acting and that kind of stuff. Bodyguard stuff, I, yeah. Yeah, and and his experiences with that. I mean, we didn't get into like all the different movies that, I mean, what is great, honestly, is the working with and, and, and talking on a personal basis with these people and, and finding out what, what motivates them, what's their, you know, uh, what, what drives them. And that's, that's what I love to talk about. Yeah, we aim for an inside look on the show, you know what I mean? Like, you could pick up the books and hear all those stories about the movies, but you might not get a full idea of the man himself. You know what I mean? And with something like this, you do. You get a good idea of the, the man himself. And he's done a giganto from acting, the bodyguard deal, to being an author, um, all types of stuff. Just, you know, great dude. Um, I had a lot of fun with this episode. And like I've said before, man, I would, we have interview questions about his whole career, but going off in just the discussion part of things that we do where we just get to kind of check sh talk shop and just kind of talk about you know regular stuff uh, i think those are the those are the kind of real special moments on the show where it's more than just we could have asked him about under siege 2 he's been asked about that a million times you could probably go online right now and find 20 people asking him about that but you know having the personal uh the vibe you know, the personal deal where, you know, that's so, so much better than anything else. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, nothing set in stone. We like to get on and riff. You know what I mean? And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That's so, uh, again, Patrick Kilpatrick, you're the best. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, we hope everybody enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, you want to say anything in closing, Hawkman? Um, nothing other than... Um... It was a great interview. Uh, he seemed to uh, enjoy talking with us. I mean, also, I don't know if you caught that, but I also kind of that we were one of the few podcasts that he still kept on. He said yep. that he wasn't. Yeah. So so that that makes me feel good that he, he decided that we were um, worth enough of his time and 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 took the time to sit down, talk to us and give us a little insight. And that's what I love. And the fact is that he's so open about giving us the inside information that, you know, you're not going to get anywhere else. And that's, that's what I loved about this interview that, uh, and, and like you said, I mean, we're going to have to get him off to Boston, Matt. We're going to have to bring him off to Boston and make some, make some movie history. I'm with that fully. Yeah, some acting and some doc, some narrative and some documentary films, and uh, we'll keep it going, keeps it popping. With that being said, we hope everybody enjoyed the show, and we'll catch you all on the next episode of the Boombastic Cast. Peace. Yeah.